Thanks to EDRMA and to the World Business Council, the Tire Industry Project, for co hosting this session with us. It's a very genuine thank you because I think a little bit more than one hour ago, CSR Europe launched in its opening session, the high level panel, an industry barometer that looks at what are sectors doing on sustainability and what are sector associations doing on sustainability. And I think only the fact, but I think more also the content that later will be provided, that the tire industry talk, will talk about sector initiatives and will talk about how they engage with other sectors is a good example of what we aim with that, uh, the fact that we at CSR Europe made that uh, sector uh, barometer. And I invite you, it's on our website, to look at the results on how different industry sectors advance or less advance on the sustainability agenda. On the next slide, on this slide, you see a tire. And that's the starting point. And it's a tire is a good object or a good part or a good uh, element to talk about sustainability, because a lot of questions of sustainability come together in a very elegant way in one tire only. Eh? If you look at one tire, you see a lot of opportunities. You see a lot of challenges that we briefly summarized on the next slide. Of course, the tire provides us the opportunity for mobility, safety at the grip of the tire, very important, but also employment opportunities. And there are others, I'm not going to go in detail. There are also a number of challenges related to it in the sourcing of natural rubber, for example, human rights related or environmental impact related. Tire plays a key role also in the decarbonization challenge and in the emission challenge for the car industry as well and other industries. And also the end of life treatment of tires is a challenge in its own right. And to tackle those challenges, uh, our leadership model that we have, if you can go to the previous slide back, our leadership model that, that CSR Europe developed outlines what is needed first, it's an individual company's approach. What is each company in the sector and related sectors doing by themselves on sustainability? And this is about their leadership, their emission uh, reduction, their approach to supply chain due diligence, etc. But they also need, and true leaders know that, need to collaborate to find solutions at scale. Even an individual company, how large it can be, it can be the biggest tire maker in the world, cannot find alone the solutions to implement them at scale. So the collaboration piece is very important. And the last element in that leadership model is the engagement with stakeholders, is the systems change. How do you work with stakeholders, with policymakers to define uh, the direction for system change? And actually today's session shows this leadership model and explores specifically the collaboration and the advocacy or the system system change piece of this leadership model. And leadership is about collaboration. We cannot say it enough at CSR Europe. Uh, and the reason that we, that we are delighted to have this session co-hosted by two initiatives of the tire industry is very important. First of all, the tire industry project that is um, facilitated by the World Business Council and uh, looks together in a number where a number of tire makers look together in a number of issues and developed also a roadmap and Ansel still will say more about that later. But there's also the, the sector association based here in Brussels led by Fazile, uh, um, ETRMA, that launched a number of years ago the European Tire and Roadway Particles Platform to deal with a specific issue of tire and, and roadwear particles. And from the beginning onwards, I think ETRMA said, we should do that not alone, but here we need other sectors to tackle that issue. We need civil society, we need academics, because uh, there is still a lack of uh, knowledge or, or data. But we also need the other sectors, the car makers, the asphalt makers, uh, etc. civil society. So. I think this session today is an example of this, uh, of this need for collaboration. So what we want to do is basically have a dialogue on these challenges by the tire industry, look at what kind of actions are possible together and how can we foster even stronger but multi-stakeholder collaboration. And you have seen the agenda and without further ado, I would, we have first Anne Cecile from the World Business Council, 
Afterwards, uh, Emmanuel Med from the Commission DG Environment will talk about how the Commission plays its role in this field. And then we will enter into a, a wider panel discussion before we conclude this session. So, Anne Cecil, thank you for joining us. And I'm happy to give the floor to you to present the work and uh, of the tire industry project of the World Business Council. The floor is yours, Anne Cecil. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you. Thanks to you and Elisa for hosting that session. And thanks for having me to kick it off today. You mentioned the tire industry project as one of the organization where collaboration on sustainability can happen within the tire industry. And indeed, it was created 15 years ago for exactly that purpose. The CEO of the 11 tire manufacturers of the time got together and decided that they should work together on addressing identifying and anticipating um, sustainability issue within the tire life cycle. And since then, they've, uh, well, the TIP has worked on a variety of issues, just to name a few things like tire and woodwork particle, which we will discuss today, as well as end of life tire management or natural rubber sustainability. But what I would like to focus on today and share with you is a framework for action that the tire industry project, or I'll just say TIP to be quicker, has uh, released and, and published a few months ago this year. And if you can go to the next slide, this framework for action, which I hope will resonate nicely with what you were talking about, uh, Stefan, around the need for collaboration and systemic change and should also uh, give us a good introduction for the rest of the session today. So if you can go back to the previous slide, Elisa, please. Um, that, uh, that framework for action uh, takes the shape of a report, which is called Sustainability Driven, um, Advancing Sustainability with the SDG Tire Sector Roadmap, is a sustainable development goals roadmap for the tire sector. And if, if the slide move, you will see a, a couple of quotes from some of the CEOs of the project that were sharing their ambition for that report, which was for it to become a reference uh, for the tire makers and their stakeholders, a reference and a guide for engagement around the big sustainability issues that Stefan already touched on in his introduction for, for the tire sector. So um, to present you the roadmap, I will first say a few words about background on the SDG and the sector. I will um, explain what you can expect to find in the roadmap itself, and we'll close with uh, some words about implementation and uh, the road to 2030. So in terms of background, uh, I don't think I'll have to convince anyone in the audience that business has a critical role to play to deliver the SDGs. If anything, COVID has made that increasingly clear. The SDG will not be delivered uh, without business. And, and the private sector has a key role to play because of four major reasons, I would say. The first one is that it's a key engine of employment. In developing countries, it's up to 90% of employment opportunities. So as such, the private sector really has a key responsibility in building an inclusive, socially inclusive uh, growth globally. Business is also a key source of technology and innovation, and the SDG needs breakthrough innovation to be realized. So clearly, that's another responsibility of business. It's also a key source of finance. The UN estimates that five to seven trillion dollars uh, are needed annually to realize the SDGs. So again, here, key responsibility and opportunity for business. And then last but not least, uh, private sector, of course, has a responsibility to mitigate any negative impact that they might have on their own operation or their value chain. So you see a focus on human rights here, but of course, all sustainability issues related to, to the value chain. So a key responsibility, but also a key opportunity for business, which I think the private sector understood quickly and adopted the framework of the SDGs as, as, a, as a universal language uh, that all stakeholders could understand easily. So if you can go to the next slide, Elisa. The, so the private sector embraced the SDG primarily and firstly at a company level. Um, the WBCSD has a bit more than 200 members and in 2020, 93% of them was uh, within their sustainability reporting, making an explicit reference to the SDGs that were most relevant to them. 
and making uh, evidence or giving evidence of their contribution uh, towards those SDG. So clearly, again, a universal language that, that everybody has embraced. But um, the issues and the actions that are needed to act on the SDGs often go well beyond the boundaries of one given association. And already in 2017, the quite influential report of Better Business, Better World was highlighting the need for sectoral approach to the SDG. It's not enough to look at it from a company point of view, you need to look at it as a sector and explain how your sector will, will uh, act on the SDGs. So the World Business Council acted on this and developed a methodology and a set of guidelines for sectors to identify where they can have the biggest impact on the SDG and, and develop a roadmap of action on how to address uh, those, those things. And it was published in 2018. And since then, it was piloted and uh, implemented by a handful of sector. So if you can go to the next slide, Elisa. The TIP members saw this opportunity of developing an SDG sector roadmap as a key opportunity to develop a common language around, because there, there are 11 competitors, but it was important to develop a common language about what the key sustainability issues for the industry were and develop a shared vision on those and uh, highlight or, or share um, a set of actions that needed to happen to deliver on this vision. Um, the tire industry has a long history of collaborating on sustainability um, for, Stefan mentioned it, but through TIP and as well as regional associations as well. So TIP has been there for 15 years. So it was, it sounded like a very good time to you know, step back, see what had been done over this period of time, see what needed to be done. And again, developing a shared vision. And most importantly, also help answer one of the trickiest questions, which is what can you do as individual company? Where do you need to collaborate with your peers? And where do you need the full involvement of the value chain? These are quite difficult questions to answer. So a working group was assembled to work together with key stakeholders from the value chain and from civil society to assemble this roadmap. Uh, this was about a 15 month process and the roadmap was published in May of this year. And I'll take you through the top lines of the roadmap. If you can click one, once or twice, Elisa. So what you can expect to see in the roadmap um, is an executive summary, if you don't have much time to read, uh, but three uh, sections, which are section, the three that you see on the right of the slide. So the first one uh, explains the background uh, information about the sector and how it interacts with the SDGs. You then have what we call impact pathway, which is really the heart of the roadmap. Um, it highlights seven areas where the sector can have the biggest impact on the SDGs and concrete action. There are 30 of them, concrete action that need to happen to enable to deliver on, on those opportunities. And then finally, a section called road to 2030, which is more about implementation and, and really the, what needs to happen in the next 10 years. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, interaction with the SDGs and the tire sector, unsurprisingly, the sector um, interacts with the 17 SDGs, but the group uh, identified eight of the SDGs are really having the most uh, alignment with, with the sector uh, or where the sector can have the biggest impact. So you see them on the screen here. The reason why number eight and number 12 are a little bigger is because they map against the roadmap actions more, most frequently. So they're really the areas where the group and their stakeholder um, evaluated that the sector could have the biggest impact. We can go to the next slide, please. So in terms of the areas where um, the tire sector can impact mostly those SDGs, the group identified seven areas um, and they're uh, split in three different buckets, one around supply chain, second one around operation, and the third one around product and services. So I won't go into the details of each of them, but just to give you a feel of uh, the different uh, topics that were identified on, on supply chain to start with, 
the uh, impact pathway number one, and I don't know if you're able to read anything on your screen, but impact pathway number one is fully dedicated to natural rubber. As uh, Stefan mentioned, it remains a key ingredient of the tire industry coming from the rubber tree, mostly grown in Asia uh, with a, a big share of smallholders in the value chain. So it's very important for the tire industry to work on the sustainability of this value chain. And that's why uh, the tire industry project about two years ago now launched the global platform for sustainable natural rubber, GPSNR, which is now operating out of Singapore and is a fully multi-stakeholder platform and uh, now operating for, for about two years. Uh, impact pathway number two is around responsible sourcing and sustainable procurement on all of the different uh, uh, services and, and materials that are required to for tire makers to operate. So it's it's larger than uh, than just uh, natural rubber. If we move to operation, um, the impact pathway number three is about decarbonization with with the net zero ambition as part of this roadmap for uh, the TIP members. Um, impact pathway number four is around uh, really uh, employment uh, and ensuring safe and inclusive and equal opportunity uh, employment for, for all of the workforce. And then impact pathway five, six, and seven is about product and services. Number five being uh, fully dedicated to tire and road wear particle, which is the topic uh, at the heart of the session today. So I'll dive into this one. Number six is around um, smart connected tire innovation, digital solution to enable uh, a faster transition to sustainable mobility. And finally, number seven uh, is about circularity and end of life tire management. So really encompassing all of the different uh, key issues of, of the tire life cycle. If you move to the next slide, Elisa, will show what um, an impact pathway, what you can expect to find in an impact pathway. And by mean of example, I took um, tire and road wear particles, so impact pathway number five. What you can find is, of course, what, what the action is about or what, what the opportunity is about. So for tire and road wear particles is to engage uh, the, the sector and its stakeholder to really find evidence-based solution to address tire and road wear particles. It then explained why the topic is relevant for the tire industry. Obviously, on tire and wood particle, that's uh, a, a, an issue for, for the for the industry. I'm sorry, I'm getting some disturbance on my screen. Um, so the tire and wood particles are the tiny particles that are generated when the tire is used. So it's by normal use of the product. So it's obviously. A, 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 key, uh, a key issue for the industry to tackle. Um, in terms of the SDGs that are mostly linked to the topic, uh, and again, I, probably a, a bit of a, an eye test for you here, but uh, you see the, the brown um, icons here are the SDGs that are mostly closely linked to the topic. So the topic of tire and wood wear particle will touch on several SDG, namely uh, the, the number 12 that you see here, but you will have the 14, 15, probably nine as well. And I, if you can read, I encourage you to take a look at the roadmap so you can see the details. Um, but the, the, for each of the pathway, it will highlight which of the SDG is, is mostly linked with the topic. And then you will have a set of actions that the group and its stakeholder identified that need to be taken. Um, who should take them? So what is the role of the sector? Is it a, a role of leading, of accelerating, of contributing? And uh, what's the level of impact and the time frame that is anticipated for this action? So for TRWP, and you won't be able to read right now, but the actions are a, a combination of research, of developing methodologies and, and frameworks, as well as engaging stakeholders to identify the evidence-based solution. And we'll, uh, we'll deep dive in this into the following conversation. Then for each of the pathways, you will have uh, identified stakeholders. Uh, so on tire and woodwork particle, again, that's one topic that really requires engagement from uh, the whole value chain, as well as public, uh, uh, public actors, regulators, as well as other industries. 
so it's really one good example that uh, can illustrate the need for broad collaboration and systemic change. So that's in a nutshell. Well, you'll see as well in the, for each of the pathways, um, we'll, we've highlighted some examples of initiatives that are already on, on the way. Uh, so for tire and water particles, for example, you see that the initiatives that are highlighted are the uh, European platform, which we'll talk about in a minute, as well as the uh, research program of the tire industry project. So, so again, I, take, I encourage you to take a look at the details of the roadmap because you'll find uh, that kind of information and actions uh, for each of the uh, topics that I mentioned. You can go to the next slide, Elisa. So the roadmap is here. It's available for stakeholders, for the tire sector, for the tire makers um, to use it as a guide for engagement. But we don't want this to be only a report. Uh, we really want uh, we really wish that it becomes uh, a, a starting point, uh, a conversation starter, uh, in order to, to really drive actions. So how does the road to 2030 look like? And it really starts with uh, the tire makers, I would say. The TIP members recognize that they have a key role to play in delivering the roadmap and driving progress. So if you can go to the next slide, Elisa. It starts with members as individual company first. Um, they committed to engage their value chain and their stakeholders individually to help advance the roadmap. They um, also will continue you know, showing and demonstrating their leadership through their own sustainability reporting and their own initiative, of course. As WBCSD members, they've also committed to, um, to abide or to meet uh, some uh, increased ambitions in terms of membership criteria to be a member of WBCSD. So that includes commitment on uh, topics like climate with, again, a net zero ambition with a science-based plan to achieve it, um, as well as some commitment around nature and biodiversity, around uh, inequalities and inclusion as well as operating uh, at the highest level of transparency. So there, there's a whole set of, of increased membership criteria that uh, TIP members will abide to. Then collectively, if you go to the next slide, Elisa, the um, tire makers also committed to leverage existing associations. So that can be ETRMA, the regional associations, that can be the global platform for sustainable natural rubber, as well as the tire industry project to really see how other actors can be engaged, as well as develop tools and frameworks to help uh, deliver the actions that are highlighted in the roadmap. So for TIP per se, the main contributions will be around tire and woodware particle research, material research, end of life tire management, as well as uh, circularity by developing some methodology around, around circularity. But uh, we also recognize the need to communicate and track the progress uh, against this roadmap and TIP will be leading that aspect as well. Um, the, the tire makers have been uh, reporting on some KPIs uh, around their uh, operational footprint, mainly on manufacturing for a few years already. But what will be done is uh, an evaluation of what additional KPIs should be put in place in order to report progress on the roadmap. And you saw that the aspects that are tackled in the roadmap are very broad. So there will be a new set of KPIs to track uh, progress. And the commitment is to do that by 2023 and then by and, and start reporting on those KPI by 2023. And they by 2026, which will be about midway to 2030, issuing a more complete report, um, again, taking stock of what has been done to date evaluating the relevance of the roadmap and seeing if there's any adjustment or additional actions that need to be added to the roadmap by 2026. And if you go to the next slide, I'd just like to close with an encouragement to all the actors or stakeholders of the tire industry that are uh, in the audience today to review the roadmap and see you know, how, how can you integrate those elements into your own strategies or your engagement with, with tire makers. Um, you see the link on the screen here, so you can download the roadmap there. And we'll also use this website as a means to 
to share progress as well as to share best practices or, or, or examples uh, of what uh, tire makers and, and their stakeholders are doing to help advance the roadmap. So with that, many thanks for your attention and I hand the word over back to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. It was very clear and showing, I think it's an example of such a roadmap on, on sustainable development for a sector. It shows the importance of tackling in a systematic way the most material issues for your sector by putting up targets up front, setting direction, but also the action at eh, the Global Platform of Sustainable Natural Rubber, to which your members contribute a lot, is a real, I think, a real game changer in the sector on uh, sourcing in a sustainable way natural rubber. The Tire and Roadware Particles platform that we will discuss is another one. So it, a roadmap is more than words like you said but it's guiding the action and i think and that's also probably what policy makers ex expect and i would like to give the floor to emmanuel mayor from the commission now and because as a sector you need to move you need to meet several expectations uh, for the tire sector be it on decarbonization human rights but also very specific challenges from a wider agenda in this case tire and roadware particles in the wider agenda of microplastics. And that's also why I think in this platform on TRWP that the direction and also the expectations from the Commission are very important. Emmanuel, I give the floor to you. I know you don't have much time left, but I still hope that you can say what you wanted to say. Please, Emmanuel. Thank you very much, first of all, for organizing the session to address the sustainability aspects of the tire industry and also for your invitation to the European Commission to join that debate. Uh, today, I will focus my intervention on the sustainability challenges raised by microplastics. Because microplastics are widespread in the marine environment and in soils, and their small size facilitates ingestion by organisms. Microplastics might also bioaccumulate through the food chain, potentially causing toxic effects on the food chain and seafood safety concerns. Several studies on tire particles in the environment show that tire wear particles are present in all environmental compartments, including air, water, soils, sediments, animals, and plants. And a report from the EU group of chief scientific advisors on the environmental health risks of microplastics pollutions of June 2019 really flagged that um, there are significant grounds for concern and for precautionary measures to be taken. So we believe that addressing this issue is also an important contribution to achieve several sustainable development uh, goals. The growing dimension of the microplastics problem calls for the involvement of citizens, businesses, stakeholders, EU institutions and governments. And indeed, multi-stakeholder partnership can give an important contribution by promoting exchange of information and dialogue between different agents, but also to identify actions. Since the launch of the platform on the European tire and road wear particles, the European Commission has welcomed this initiative and we have participated actively in its meetings through different services of the uh, European Commission. We also had fruitful and frank dialogue with the European Association for Tires and Rubber Manufacturers, and we will continue that um, dialogue. Now, when you look at you know, this growing scientific evidence and the increasing concerns of uh, citizens, it was clear that the European Green Deal and the Circular Economy Action Plan announced that the European Commission would propose measures to tackle microplastics. This is also relevant in the context of the zero pollution strategy. 
President van der Leyen stated at the European Parliament that the Commission wanted to open a new front against microplastics pollution and a legislative proposal is planned for next year to reduce the release of microplastics in the environment and to restrict the addition of microplastics in products. On this, we distinguish between intentionally added microplastics and unintentional release of microplastics. On intentionally added microplastics, a reach restriction dossier is currently in preparation and the European Commission is assessing the measures proposed by the European Chemicals Agency. So this relates to restrictions that could cover added microplastics in multiple applications, including agriculture, horticulture, cosmetic products, paints, coatings, detergents, maintenance products, medical and pharmaceutical applications. On unintentional releases of microplastics, an impact assessment study is being developed on policy measures to reduce the release of microplastics with a focus on three critical sources of emissions, tires, textiles, and pellets. So this study will evaluate measures along the entire value chain, starting with eco-design measures and taking into account the control at source and precautionary principles in order to prevent or reduce emissions as a priority. When carrying out this impact assessment, we will ensure consistency with other existing or future initiatives like the review of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive or the studies on tire abrasion or the revision of the tire labeling regulation. So in that context, we very much count on your expertise and the participation of stakeholders, either in bilateral contacts or stakeholder consultations. A first stakeholder consultation took place in September and we had many uh, participants, more than 180, representing the plastic pellets, tires, and textiles value chain, but also beyond uh, these sectors like waste, water, paints, also national administration and um, non governmental organizations. So at the European Commission, we have every interest to work together on the sustainability of tires on progress being made by the industry. And I would like to wish you a very good discussion on this critical matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank you for being with us and, and making this invitation or this ongoing invitation, because I think there's already a lot of work being done together of working together because that's what is indeed needed in this uh, in this area. I would like now to move to the panelists, to the speakers uh, who are involved in one way or another with the Tire and Rotary Particles platform. It's an initiative launched in 2018. It was an initiative of one sector. It was the European Tire and Rubber Manufacturer Association who wanted to deal with that issue asked CSR Europe to facilitate this, and that's our role, basically, of bringing together different players, in this case, different sectors, so not only not different companies, what we usually do, but also different sectors across the, to make it across sectorial initiatives, initiative to bring the stakeholders together, public authorities, research institutes, because as I said earlier, and I think Fazile will repeat it later on as well, we needed to share the scientific knowledge. We needed also to look into, and, and the work has been done and is to be found on the website as well, what are possible mitigation measures in terms of to tackle generation or transportation of tire and roadwear particles. Because as Emmanuel Mero already outlined, eh, those tiny debris are formed during normal driving conditions. Eh? Um, and they are uh, made up by uh, through the friction of the tire and, and the asphalt, basically, or the road surface, but are influenced also by different elements, the weight of the car, the tire design, the style of driving, etc. So if you want to limit the generation 
there are different factors that can be influenced, some with a bigger effect, others with a smaller effect. But it's always a trade-off because safety needs a tire to have grip on the road, meaning bringing friction into the equation. Um, so I would like now first to invite Vasile Sinara, the Secretary General of ETRMA, uh, who will say present us some more details about this initiative, and then we'll go through our panel. Vasile, the floor is yours. You have to unmute. I am, yeah, I was muted. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to to make the journey together because, well, with styles, the journey can only be safe. But I'd like to come back to what Anne Cecile said. It's not enough for a company to act as a company. It's not enough, I have to say, as a sector. The, the journey that we undertook back in uh, 2018 was really to start this journey as a multi stakeholder approach. And this is what I would like to uh, share with you this experience. You know, um, the challenge is a complex one. The challenge is a serious one. And I think the industry being also serious in what, what can be achieved, we needed to take it really step by step. So that's, uh, and thank you all for your participation and contribution to this journey. So if we can go to the first slide, uh, Elisa, please, maybe one more. So Tyran wrote where particles are tiny debris which are formed from the friction of when the tire hits the road, a phenomenon happens. Commonly associated to the microplastic because of their size and composition, these particles um, cannot be automatically considered as uh, microparticles from other sources. They do contribute into the environment. They are there. So tires indeed are designed to grip. That's the function of the tire. Um, the friction is necessary in order to provide this necessary safety, but also leading to the generation of, um, of these particles. Thanks to the effort of the, um, it was explained, the World Business Council for System Development and the tire industry project as a whole, these particles have been characterized. This is the result of 15 years of research that these particles are elongated in the form of a cigar, like when you use uh, um, an eraser on a piece of paper, so it's elongated. Their size distribution is around 80 micron. It's a mixture, it's a new material composed of 50-50, more or less, of rubber coming from the thread, but also of minerals and dust on the road surfaces. These particles have also a higher density. It's around 1.8 gram per cubic centimeter, which is, as you know, much higher than the average environmental uh, density of other microplastics, which is around one milligram per cubic centimeter. Next slide. Tires, uh, as we said already, will play an essential role in the sustainable mobility. The friction of the tire, which is what provides this the safety is essential in order to really guarantee road safety, but it is the same friction that brings the environmental benefits in terms of reducing CO2 emissions, in terms of rolling noise emissions. So it is the same friction that provides the same, the same performance. So it is indeed a complex phenomenon for which factors beyond tire design, like driving behavior, like the characteristics of the road of the vehicle, like the weather conditions have actually uh, even more, if, even if not more, uh, influence on the abrasion rate. So tackling the tire and roadway particle challenge required and requires still a mobilization of all the relevant stakeholders through a holistic multisectorial approach. And I would like to thank all the, really all the sectors that have joined us in this journey. If you can slip one more time, please, Elisa. Um, so as early as 2018, that was the journey that we undertook to look at uh, how we could deploy a, a series of actions that were based on three pillars, but the three pillars were interdependent from each other. Um, it's only by the combining supportive science mitigation action and the multi-stakeholder cooperation that we we believe we can really address in a sustainable manner 
this complex sustainability challenge. So the first pillar is science. It's already, already said, significant knowledge gaps still persist on and around the topic of tire and roadway particles. There are still uncertainties around their identification, around their distribution, also around the impact and the contribution of these microplastic to the microplastic pollution in the environment. Um, also, I think this is another barrier that we have, which limits our, our ability to address effectively the issue. Some facts there, which are very important, is that the most recent industry research looked into the particle distribution and retention in freshwater and saltwater settings. The study found uh, that because of the density of these particles and the diameters, the size, about 95% tend to settle in soil and freshwater sediments, 95%. It's around two to 5%, which may, which may end up at the estuary you know, of the rivers, which is the starting point of, uh, of the aquatic uh, environment. These particles do settle before degradation, namely along the road size and to some lesser extent in the freshwater sediment. But these findings, which were uh, commissioned by ETRMA back in 2017, based on these findings, the tire industry, the TIP, is now financing further research that looks on the presence and the impacts of these particles in the different compartments, soil, river, and ocean, in order to characterize the degradation, but also to investigate the long-term imp exposure impacts. We expect to receive the results early 20, 2012. 2022, 2022, it's an exercise. <laughs> That's the first pillar of the, of the action. The second pillar is um, the mitigation. And there by far the most important mitigation action actually looks at the tire design. Um, industry is constantly, as you know, investigating and investing, innovating to improve the performance trade-offs. Um, it, was all, it also launched in 2018, like in 20, an intensive program to advance on a method for qualitative assessment on uh, tire abrasion rate, a method that could be used for regulatory purposes. This I think very important, it has to be done rightly. The method should be also representative of the European driving conditions and the targets, but also uh, mindful of the new technologies in order to minimize the trade-offs. For example, wet traction trade-off is very important. And we are convinced that this new test method will also eliminate progressively the worst performing tires, but also independently of the vehicle specificity. So I think what we are looking for is indeed a robust test method. That's the second mitigation action. And then we have the third and necessary complementary pillar, which is actually cooperation. Um, faced with this sustainability challenge, as I said, ITRMA went beyond the boundaries of the sector also for us was the first time, to, by proactively inviting other sectors to engage on these uh, topics, which are so also important for them. We invited to engage together towards solutions that also co-create some solutions. And then in July 2018, as it was said by Stefan, the European Tire and Roadware Particle Platform was launched with facilitation of uh, CSR Europe. If we can click one more, um, please. Thank you. This platform uh, brings together really a number of very important stakeholders. They, uh, they are, of course, ranging from the European Commission to member states, local authorities, but importantly, we have a very important academia and science institutions present, and it, it has grown actually over, over the years. But also we have the road industry, the vehicle industry, the chemical suppliers, wastewater treatment industries, the automotive clubs, as well as civil society organizations, bringing support, enlarging this, this debate in order to really have a, a create, to, to have a, an, an open and transparent open dialogue to look at the science, but to also share the common understanding on the possible effect of these particles. As Stefan said, which happened during the normal use of a car. And then more importantly, and by far the most important element is a co-design mitigation options. So this platform, if you can one more time, please Elisa, uh, click. This platform has uh, indeed produced a number of 
concrete uh, steps have been have been realized. I will just give you a few of them. For example, in the science compartment, 60 more studies have been reviewed. Uh, the result of this revision of this review was published um, in the form of a scientific report. This report is publicly available. It is actually a, a work that effectively informs also the European Commission microplastics and abrasion studies, which were recently launched, as was reminded by Emmanuel Mayer. Another important um, outcome of this of this work uh, in the la and at least in the first two years and a half was a way forward report. This for this report, which was released at the end of uh, 2019, beginning of 2020, explores the most promising ways of mitigating the environmental impact of tire and road wear particles. You have measures towards the mitigation of the generation of particles. This is the abrasion test method under development. But we also have measures towards particle capture and removal. And one of the most effective is simple, but I think we need to also change our ways of, of, of driving, of living. But one of the most effective and simplest way of reducing tire and road wear particle production is really to take care of our tires, check the condition of the tire, the tire pressure, and also change the way how we drive. A slower and less aggressive driving will also reduce degradation and uh, production of tire and road wear particles. And the third deliverable on this cooperation is that this cross-sectorial cooperation has become a reference and keeps incentivizing the dialogue. It is attracting new partners. Uh, in the last uh, few months, we have seen really a number of new partners joining and enriching this debate. And we are convinced that sustainability does ask a crossing of boundaries with focus on shared and collaborative solutions. And we will strive to increasing further the engagement within the platform. We need indeed that this engagement translate into more action, that we are on the way towards that. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is that the tire, if you can click maybe one final time, uh, please, Elisa. Um, the tire industry, well, is fully engaged and will continue this dialogue in the future and we will maintain our commitment to delivering on concrete and practical solutions. We will also continue filling the knowledge gaps. As I explained, TIP is, is going to deliver a number of important information in the, in the next uh, six months or so, because we believe that science-based actions, technology, innovation, and cooperation are key to solving the issue of microplastic pollution. Finally, the tire performances, as we all know, are a delicate balance between conflicting requirements. This requires indeed a holistic and a complementary approach in order to lead to strong synergies among the different stakeholders and bring forward the effective, implementable and necessary but balanced solutions. The, the, the journey, as I said, is, uh, has not been easy, but we are encouraged by also the trust and the support that all the different partners into this uh, cooperative environment is bringing to make this also uh, safe, but also attractive in the end, but forward looking for sure. So I would like to thank you, uh, Stefan, for giving us the opportunity of, and again, I'd like to thank all the partners who are joining us today for their support. Thank you very much, Leslie, for that overview. And if, if you can stay for a moment more, because I think uh, we see in, in uh, the sustainability network we are that companies, in order to tackle their sustainability challenges, start collaborating a lot in their value chain or in their supply chain. So moving out also to other companies from other sectors. I think the TRWP platform is from the outset a platform where you went beyond the boundaries of your sector association in order to engage other sector associations like from automotive, asphalt, wastewater treatment, etc. On those topics that are as material that are in a certain way also material to them. But what do you and you said it's hard work eh? and we can witness that it's sometimes hard work, but what would be needed to make that cross sectorial collaboration more successful, how do you see this agenda being even more driven and more action oriented than it is now in the in the kind of cross sectorial way. I think the, the key is actually probably 
the fact that the Commission could be in a more proactive mode to support this cross-sectorial approach, but also sustainability somehow is is requesting that there is a, a the, the, the silo work is not able, not only we are not able to work as a sector independently, but also within the commission, probably we need to have this uh, crossing of the boundaries and uh, the need to look for collaborative solutions. So we would like probably to see maybe an increased engagement from our institution players as well. And commission is definitely the one that we would like to, uh, to see more and more present there. Yes. Thank you for uh, responding to that question. I will go now to, indeed, uh, we, we talked about the other sectors and how they are engaged in the platform. And one of those sector association that that uh, is engaged is the European Asphalt Pavement Association. And I would like to give the floor to Dr. Gomez to explain some of the background of the association and about its involvement in this project that came from the tire industry. Dr. Gomez, the floor is yours, Brexit. So thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. It's uh, a pleasure being here. Thank you for the invitation and to, to be in this panel and to basically continue the discussions that we come that we often have in this in this platform. So it's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. I have prepared some slides simply to to show a bit uh, for the audience who we are and and, and, and basically what is asphalt? I think everybody knows what a tire is, what a vehicle is, but uh, not many people know what asphalt is. So uh, I would like to show, yes, in this slide, we can see uh, what is asphalt. If we could cut the, the road, have a cross section, we will see that at the bottom, we have a soil or an aggregate. And on top, we place this material, which is uh, what keeps this characteristic black uh, color to more than 90% of the European roads uh, that we have nowadays. It's a material that 95% of it is an aggregate, it's a stone material, and then we have a 5% uh, with, is a binder to keep these particles together, which is what gives the, the black color. The, the mission of, of asphalt, what, why do we put asphalt on the road? Uh, actually, we have many reasons, and all of them are relevant for the discussions that probably we'll have later. And so, for example, we need to give a, an even profile for the comfort of the user and to provide low rolling resistance to actually we have types of asphalt that can reduce the fuel consumption of the of the vehicles by five or even 10%. So that's very important for asphalt. We also need to provide a, enough texture to ensure a minimum and safe skid resistance. So to make sure that vehicles don't just slide on the road. Also to provide rapid drainage of the surface water when it rains noise reduction, durability, of course, in terms of sustainability, and why not maybe we need to define some new uh, criteria on how to design asphalt to make it low, uh, to produce low tire wear. In the next slide, so now that we know that what is asphalt, basically, I work for the European Asphalt Pavement Association, which is a nonprofit organization uh, funded almost 50 years ago, and basically whose mission is to give voice to the European asphalt pavement industry, uh, in, uh, including asphalt manufacturers, contractors, and of course also material suppliers and equipment manufacturers. So in the next slide, we can see that these are the members we have now at IAPA. The European Association is a, an association of national associations. At the moment, we have uh, the representation of 16 different nations. You can see in the next slide as well a bit in the map more easy to find. Yes, you can see these are the nations that we are. And in the next slide, we also have at the moment 23 associate members, which are companies directly related, most of them with material supply and equipment manufacturers. So these are also members of the association. Uh, in the next slide, we can see that EAPA is also a member of what we call the Global Asphalt Pavement Alliance, together with the Asphalt Association of, for example, the US, Mexico, South, uh, South Africa, Japan, Australia, and so on. Next slide. Our objectives is to participate in the European standardization and legislation activities, represent our members in the institutions of the European Union, promote the effective and sustainable use of asphalt and new developments, collect, exchange, and promote knowledge, as well as best practices. This is part of why we are in this uh, platform. 
improve the image of asphalt. If you can continue. Be a reliable partner for the European Commission, Parliament, and so translate technical or other details in, in easy way for the Commission, the Parliament, and other policymakers, road authorities, and so. And finally, of course, we also do our lobbying through position papers, political statements, and uh, we take part in consultation at European level, and we also take care of legislation in, in advance. And finally, we have, just to show you that we have different committees, but probably the most relevant is the committee that we have on health, safety, and environment, where we handle topics such as different types of, of emissions, uh, CO2, and so. We also talk about a lot about the circular economy of this material that we are producing. And of course, and especially since the last two, three years that we belong, that we took part in this platform, uh, we also discuss the topic of tire and road wear particles in every meeting that we have. So this is a, a very important topic in our agenda at the moment. And I think with this, I finished this introduction. I uh, give you here my contact details for any questions. And Stefan, I don't know if you have any questions, just please. No, thank you very much. And since you raised the issue of questions, at the participants to this debate have the opportunity to write questions in the chat. And I, I already noticed that Ancecil was responding to it. And I would encourage indeed, also given the time, that the panelists now or after the session and the, the platform stays open even until the end of December, I believe. So you can respond to questions that might be sometimes very specific questions uh, on that uh, chat that is linked to this session. But um, Dr. Gomez, I had maybe another question. Looking at this issue of tire and roadware particles and how to deal with it, how do you see for the sector association you work for, the added value in the engagement with the other sectors. So what is the value for you to participate in that? And how can then your industry even work in a more collaborative way or in a collaborative way with the other sectors to mitigate the issue? Well, I mean, one thing that we, we, we have to understand is that maybe uh, the road itself is not, uh, so let's say the contribution of plastics to this tire and road where particles, as Fasil had said, the contribution of plastics to this, these particles is not significant, it's not really important from the road, but still certain road characteristics makes that actually the road or the design, through the designing of the road, the road can be part of, a significant part of the solutions. So there are characteristics that affect the rate of production of these particles. So for example, in a very simplified way, uh, the topology of the road. If we have a lot of bends, crossings, junction, junctions, uh, roundabouts, and so we are going to produce more particles. And also if we have materials in the surface that are very rough or has a lot of texture, we are going to produce as well more particles. So it's not an easy solution. It's not just about saying, okay, let's reduce the, the texture of the road. As I said before, that will have consequence, for example, on the skid resistance, and we cannot accept certain uh, solutions that uh, compromise the road safety or sustainability in, in other ways. So this is why it's a complex problem for us. We know that we might not be uh, a main uh, source of the problem, let's say, but through appropriate design, we can be a very significant part of the solution. And this is why we need to learn, we need to understand exactly the mechanisms behind the production of these particles, how different characteristics of the road affect on the production of these particles, and then maybe we can include it in our design uh, criteria. So this is why we are very interested in, in, in learning and, and sharing. Thank you very much. And I will go now to the other side of the equation or the other side of the tire on top of that, it's a car. Well, in a lot of cases, it's a car. So it's a pleasure to have Moi Tiagi from ASEA, the Car Manufacturers Association Technical Affairs Director to bring his perspective on this challenge of tire and roadware particles and why is it relevant, if it's relevant and how is it relevant for the automotive industry and how the automotive industry can contribute to the mitigation and to the, the work that is being done in this platform. Mohit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks a lot for giving me the floor and good afternoon to all the participants and the speakers. <clears throat> 
and and thank you for the CSI Europe and ETRMA for organizing the organizing the summit. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a good platform to discuss the way forward and somehow cooperate. And I can see Fazilet already having a very positive smiling face. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm I'm already uh, looking forward to share my experience and and my and my notes. I would say. Uh, the tire and the road we are particles and the journey what we are taking and the developments what we are having are of high importance for the automotive industry. In short, what I can say that tires are the link that provides mobility for our mobility solutions. So I can't say stress enough how tires are important. Uh, I also would like to note that, uh, make a note here that automotive industry with the tire industry are facing tremendous challenges, given all the regulatory developments being discussed around. And not only for the tire wear abrasion, but also touching on one of the most important essential trade off. When I say trade offs, it's rolling resistance and the noise, which are of high importance for the automotive industry. Uh, if, I, if I just see, uh, let's say, a year before, I have many studies, many initiatives, many regulatory proposals being, being right now discussed. For example, the Euro 7 draft proposal, which is already discussing on having a uh, limits or, or a baseline for the tire and the brake wear particles. Uh, the commission uh, colleagues, Emmanuel, already mentioned on the REACH regulation for the reduction of uh, tire microplastic and chemical composition. There's a third initiative uh, on the EU regulation 2020-740, which gives the obligation to incl include tire abrasion in the durability indicator. The fourth is on the, on the noise phenomena study which is talking about the sound abatement measures, the zero emission action plan. There is an industry study, I would say, uh, funded in the EU Horizon 2020, which is Leon T, which is also working on the tire wear. There is a European Commission Emisia study, which is working again on the noise limit reduction. And these are only six uh, briefly, uh, which is on the top of the surface. and and. There are even more going on, and as, as TRWP platform is also discussing numerous of studies. I would say we are convinced that with this initiative, we progress on having a realistic understanding on tire wear and its cost to the industry, as well as the product cost and consumer cost. Uh, we call very famous term CBA, uh, but also at the same time, we seek for a much coordinated approach from all the regu different regulatory developments that I just explained in this field. Uh, I, I think having said that, uh, again, I'm repeating, this is a very important topic. And, and uh, for the automotive industry, we are highly keen uh, to work together. When I, when I go to more technical side uh, on the mitigation of the tire particles, I think we should not forget the trade-off. Uh, and and Fazilet has already taken this uh, in, her, in, her, in her briefing. There are several trade-offs regarding rolling resistance, noise, wet grip, longitudinal lateral echoplaning, braking, yeah, which has on other side the same importance level or even higher uh, for the road safety. Uh, ASIA did a study, uh, tire performance study in 2019. Uh, it's already public. Uh, and then we extended this study for the tire wear program in 2021 yeah, to, to aiming at determining the interdependency on these uh, trade-offs, what I just explained. Uh, we, we, we checked on the vehicle safety parameters. We, we saw the impact on the CO2 reduction, braking performance, rolling resistance, and we obtained a conclusion that obtaining a low level of rolling noise without jeopardizing other parameters essential for the vehicle safety and CO2 emission reduction could not be proven as feasible. We have to compromise and there would be compromises further and further. We can't just, it, it's normal physics. Yeah? We can't have everything on the highest level uh, when we change any of the constellation or the physics or the chemicals of the tires. There will be also compromises. And uh, as I said, we did a tire wear study in 2021. Uh, the report is still under review at our side. We will be making it public. We did a very normal, I would say tire wear testing, yeah, and the tire lifespan. And this is already being discussed in the auspices of the TRWP regularly. And uh, as we know, the tire lifespan really depends on numerous factors. Let's say driving circuit, driving style, weather, vehicle characteristics and conditions, wheel alignment, transmissions, and as Dr. Gomez said, road surface, yeah, asphalt type. Uh, 
we we used a very commonly used sizes which are which are uh, quite dominant in the eu uh, road traffic uh, we did these uh, we drove these vehicles for uh, i would say 15000 kilometers and at an average speed of 60 to 70 kilometers per hour speed yeah representing a normal driving pattern uh, we observed a weight and the grooves reduction uh, so example at a 15000 kilometers the mean loss of the tires uh, is between 0 0.10 0 0.10 to 0 0.32 kilogram and it is always on the higher tendency when it's the driving axle let's say in the front and in percentage it comes to 1 to 3.4% of the tire loss for 15000 kilometers when i talk about the tire depth loss it's averaging between 0.66 to 1.37 mm and when i talk in percentage or translate in percentage it's 9.7% to 19.6% we then evaluated the behavior on interactions of the between wear noise and the grippability and must highlight that it is really difficult to draw the conclusions. You have, uh, if you see the range between 0.10 to 0.32 kilogram and a, a depth loss from nine to 19%, uh, it, it's really, we even are now confused uh, in what direction to say and, and what is the judgment from our side. But one thing what we have noted is a better grip tends to be synchronous with a higher noise generation and combined to more significant wear. So if we have a better grip, you will have a uh, higher noises on the vehicle, which is again, contradictory situation for us. And it have a more significant wear. So now where should we compromise? Should we compromise on the safety? Should we compromise on the noise? Or should we comp compromise on the tire wear? So these three things are really important, the main pillar of the EU legislative actions. I think that's, uh, that's what I have explained technically. And sorry, I was not able to prepare some presentations, but uh, definitely i will supply these information soon our studies are already public and the tire wear will already be complemented uh, with the old study by end of this year and i will be happy to present this study uh, again in the trwp conference call and looking forward yeah but at the end we call for a coordinated approach uh, between all the industry stakeholders to find a practical solutions to mitigate the tire and the road wear particles also with the support of the regulators and the policy makers in EU and internationally. And uh, yeah, that's that's the minimum what I can say. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And that was very strong uh, the, the case you make on the trade-offs because that is indeed the problem or, or the challenge for, for, this, for this specific sustainability challenge. There is not one size only that you can tackle. Eh? You have to look at those different elements. And sometimes that also limits then the, uh, the possibility of, uh, of limiting the generation of tire and roadway particles. But that's also, and I saw a question already going in the direction in the chat on how to capture particles uh, before they end up in nature, because that is some direction of work that is being looked at into the, uh, on the platform basically. And we have with us, uh, Daniel Wenghaus, researcher in the TU of Berlin, uh, who is working on a project in that line. So that question came right on time. And Daniel, I give the floor to you to present the work you are doing in your urban filter project, is my understanding. Please. Uh, am I online already? All right. Ah, OK, now. So thank you very much for the invitation, of course, and for the, the nice introduction. Um, I'm happy that uh, I can introduce to you our uh, actually ongoing project Urban Filter, which is funded by the Audi Environmental Foundation, uh, which you should see on the first slide, Elisa. Is the, is the first slide online? Slides will be coming. No, it's not yet online, but they will be coming. All right. That so then I will use the, uh, okay. Anyway, I will use the time. Thank you, Elisa. Um, to introduce my department and uh, myself on the next slide. Uh, I'm coming from, as mentioned already, from the Technical University of Berlin. And I'm a research assistant of Professor Beinbruch from the Chair of Urban Water Management. And me personally, I'm a mechanical engineer and working since 2013 on the topics of microplastics. Uh, 
now within the years, we are quite a big team working on microplastics from different influence. Um, but me personally, I focused more and more on tire and road wear particles, as you also can see on the next slide, please. Because what we had to uh, recognize is that from the emission point of view, for Germany, we estimate around 110,000 uh, tons tire material, which is lost somewhere. And uh, a German study just focused on, on this question where it might end up and where it is accumulated. Because for us in urban water management, of course, it's very important how much uh, we will find in the urban area in the rural area and on motorways, for example, especially if we have uh, some technical solutions in mind. So what is shown here is that for Germany, we, uh, the estimation is that about 30 percent, 29 percent of the tire wear material um, is lost in urban area. For the EU, it's about 30 percent. 40%, and equally for rural and motorways, it's also around 30 to 40%. And what you see below uh, the graphic is that the part of the surface water, so which tire wear particles end up in the surface water, and there you see that mostly the, the pathway from the urban areas um, the particles end up in the surface water like rivers and lakes. And that's because most of the, if we have a separate system, uh, which is also mentioned on the next slide, please. Um, if you have a separate system, um, then the road runoff isn't treated at all, generally. They are more or less uh, systems available, but it also doesn't make sense to implement them everywhere. And uh, that is one idea which we follow up in the urban filter project. But before we uh, had another research project now where we tried to figure out hotspots for tire wear emissions in inner city. Uh, and on the next slide, you might get an idea about uh, sampling activities. We did quite simple things like road sweeping uh, and then analyze the dust on main roads, on uh, our um, airport. And we also analyzed road run of water with a, with a special designed uh, sampling basket. And the results, uh, you get a brief idea on the next slide where we could figure out that um, most of the tire wear end up in a driving situation of curve and near traffic lights, which is to get an idea of how much more uh, on a curve, it might be up to seven times more and on a traffic light up to three times more than for example, on a slope or a straight road. So if we would implement a filter or focus on technical solutions, it makes more, most sense to focus at first on curves and traffic lights. Um, and on the next slide, I just want to highlight the generally the opportunities of the urban filter projects, which came up so far with a modular solution for these hotspots I, I, I showed you before, but also having an intelligent network in mind. So just not only a, a technical filter solution, but also uh, combine, for example, weather forecasts uh, with uh, professional street cleaning machines. And one easy example would be, please clean the street before the rain event is starting and please as close as possible until the rain is starting. And one extra um, point we are focusing on in our urban filter project is the enlightenment of the citizens. Um, which I'm going to introduce to you some slides later. So generally, in a city, we defined um, spots like a downtown area, an urban edge, and an industrial area, where you always have different conditions. And therefore, up to now, we developed nine modules at three stages. 
the stages are interesting because we have the upper straight upper stage the street then the gully itself and the drain and for example on the if we focus on the module three it is sedimentation in the road which directly addresses the 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 um, asphalt colleagues uh, we heard just before there we have for example a porous structure in mind because we don't we definitely want to avoid the particles um, getting into the surface water or entering the gully. So if we are able to keep them on the road uh, afterwards for, for a professional street cleaning machine, it might be far easier to, to keep the particles than we do in this small area of the gully. Then for example, if you focus on module six, um, it will help us to, the funnel will help us to bring the solids at the bottom of the gully system. And then if we would combine it, for example, with module eight, it's a magnetic module. And there we figured out some very interesting things that road dust and especially the fine matter of the road dust is magnetic. I will show you some slides for that later. Unfortunately, I'm on the next slide, I'm not able to, uh, no, I'm on slide 10, sorry, Elisa. <laughs> Um, the next slide. There you will see the, our test stand. Um, and here we, we have the possibility to test our um, filter systems or our modules under defined conditions. Uh, because I can't show the video now, I I'm really would be happy to invite you to come to Berlin and just uh, have a view at the technical um, devices we have there. So on the next slide, I just give you a rough idea about the testing material we are using there. Ah, the video is working. Um, what we use as test material on slide number 11 is the, the real road dust. We fraction the road dust and then we dust it in defined portions. And at the effluent of our filter um, in the technicum, technicum uh, we definitely know then how much of each friction we could separate with our system. And we don't have the discussion what would repre represent road dust the best. And just by the way, we heard um, Fazile's introduction about tire and road wear particles. So if you separate the road dust, you have different size frictions. Uh, starting from very fine matter up to larger than five millimeters. And the TRWP might be here around 80 micron. So it would be in the fraction on the very left side, which 63 to 125 micrometer. Just to give you a very rough idea about what we are talking about on the one hand, tire wear, and on the other hand, if we want to separate tire road wear particles from road runoff, we also have to separate all the other particles. Um, here is one slide to the experimental magnet investigation. What I just wanted to show you here uh, is that, especially the fine fraction, up to 40% of this fine matter we, we saw uh, on the picture before is magnetic. Up to now, we don't know how much of this material is tire wear, but we know the total mass, 40%, works with this magnetic system, which might be helpful anyway. If we have, if we can separate TRWP with it, it would be really great. And if we could also separate other fine matter with, with it, it might also be very helpful. Um, on the next slide, I can give you just a brief idea about our exhibition. Uh, we are touring through Germany. Uh, um, and on the next slide, I prepared a photo of our exhibit where you can see, find the three stages with three module on each state. So three by three makes nine modules, um, which you can combine individually. And I or um, a video would explain to you the technique behind. And on the next slide, uh, there we got the kickoff of our tours through Germany. It was the Green Tech Festival. Um, 
which is sponsored by Audi and the uh, field of cooperation, our urban filter project, which is uh, funded by the Audi Environmental Foundation. And on the next slide, we were happy to invite uh, some German politicians, uh, our environmental minister, Svenja Schulze, and Berlin's major um, Müller, uh, and Professor Barenbruch uh, introduced the urban filter project and, of course, other works we are focusing on. Um, and now I just want to invite you finally on the last and the very last slide to uh, visit our urbanfilter.org homepage and feel free to find the right filter system. And if you choose one for each hotspot, so we, we, we made six, six combinations for you, so it's not too difficult maybe. Uh, and finally, we'll give you a feedback if you did a good job or if you could improve uh, your, your, uh, yeah, your combination of filter for each hotspot. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the possibility to talk. And finally, the last word, it came already, but collaboration is definitely the right way to, to, to find good solutions and to reduce uh, tire and roadway particles to end up in the environment. Thank you. No, thank you, Dr. Wenghausen. I think what you are showing is on, on this very complex, uh, we all know the issue, uh, and, 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 but we also see, and through the different presentations, the complexities related to how to deal with it. But true, and that was one of the, the topics also discussed uh, in, in the platform itself, through this hotspot approach that you are taking in a very practical and very visible way, it gives hope of some kind of uh, solution. But yeah, if you do this filter system in the road, so you will need to work indeed with all those sectors together. But hotspots and practical, I think those are the main uh, added values of, of the work, let alone about all the scientific knowledge that you develop. But from a practical point of view are the ones that uh, speak to that. Now, the question is, from civil society point of view, especially from the IUC and the International Union for Conservation of Nature, is this enough? Are these collaborative platforms the way to go? How can civil society in itself contribute uh, to that? Uh, and why did you participate with IUC and in this platform? So I would like to give the floor to Alberto uh, to give us some answers to these questions. Uh, Alberto Arroyo Schnell from uh, the IUCN. Thank you very much, Stefan. I am aware of the time constraints, so I will try to keep it short. Uh, I have now behind me, actually, because I didn't add it to the, to the slides. You see a representation of the SDGs. This is an SDG summit. This is a special representation of the SDGs taking into account the planet. Because at the very end, if we don't have a planet, we don't have SDGs. We don't have anything to discuss about. So what you see here is in the lower layer, the biosphere-related SDGs, after you see the society ones and after you see the economy ones. And if you don't, if we are not able to fulfill the SDGs that are in the lowest level, we simply cannot discuss about the rest. This is just where the place where we live. This is our house, our home. And if we don't have it right, we will have challenges. And I want to highlight it because it's also, it was very interesting to see the first presentation from Anne Cecil about the SDG roadmap that the WBCSD, I hope I say it correctly, uh, is preparing or has just prepared. I think it's very, very important that uh, this is being prepared, but I will really encourage very much to ensure that the ones, the SDGs related with the planet are specially looked at. And this set, as I said, I'm, I'm going to be as short as possible, but of course, there is an important issue also to highlight in this debate, which is the environment, what has been said already. I am representing the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. This is a special organization. We are not an NGO. We are an international organization closer to because we have a number of members of IUCN that are governments and a number of members that are NGOs, land users and others. Therefore, I will not say that we are exactly on the civil society side, but we are part of it. But you will, you have seen actually that in, an, a number of uh, members of the platform are actually from the civil society, NGOs such as Plastic Soup. So there, there is a representation of the NGOs, of course, in this platform. Now this said, 
we have been discussing about a number of issues related with a very specific challenge, which are the microplastics uh, from the tires. Well, uh, there is a, an important issue to consider here all the time when we, when we discuss about environment. Uh, it's true that the climate is always the key issue when it comes to environment, and it's the one that we are taking care of mostly because it's very high on the political agenda. Biodiversity is the other one, and biodiversity is the one that we are dealing with uh, specially. Uh, as you know, plastic pollution is uh, at, the most, at the moment the most widespread problem affecting the marine environment. It's threatening not only habitats and species, but also health, food safety and quality, human health, coastal tourism, and contributes, of course, to climate change. So this is a fundamental issue. I'm not going to say the figures that we are all aware of, maybe only one that is a typical one, but it's useful in this context. It's expected that we'll have more plastic than fish in terms of weight in the sea by 2050. This is from the L. MacArthur Foundation. So at the moment, the issue that we have with plastics is huge, to put it in simple words. When it comes to microplastics, uh, there, is a, there is a number of studies highlighting the relevance of it in the ocean environment. There is a study from 2017 that highlights the relevance of two particular sectors here, the tires, or the tires and, uh, and uh, road wear particles, as we have been discussing for a while now. And the second one is the textiles. Uh, this, are, this publication is actually an IUCN publication from 2017. There was another one also at the time from Eunomia, but the numbers were very more or less the same. And uh, basically it was highlighting the primary sources of microplastics in the oceans. Now, when it comes to our work and just a couple of uh, words about what we do simply because it is relevant in the context of plastics, okay, if we are dealing with biodiversity, why this is relevant? We have a number of projects that are trying to investigate how, or not only investigate, also to come up with some potential actions, uh, how plastics are affecting the environment and what can we do about it? I'm not going to mention them, but only some ideas. Uh, there is one project where we are focusing on islands. It's, plastic, it's called Plastic Waste Free Islands where we try to see in an environment where we can calculate inputs and outputs relatively easily, we can have some information about where the plastic ends up. We have also some projects on marine plastics and coastal communities in the Indian Ocean and Asia Pacific regions. We also work on hotspotting and shaping action, and we are coming up very soon with our freshwater and marine plastics framework. All this is information that is helping, of course, in the global level. I will come also to that in a moment. Let's go to the next slide. Our primary role anyway in Europe, because we are working very much on the, in the European context, is uh, more, mostly related with policy. Because of course the European Union has a very important uh, role, not only in the European context, but also beyond, because the European idea is helping uh, in the whole global discussion and is setting an example, not only for this issue actually, but for many environmental issues. So when the European Union is, taking a step, the world is watching. And therefore it's important what is happening here for the rest of the, of the world. Let's go to the next slide. Well, with the support of the Principality of Monaco, I also have to highlight, of course, we had a, a report in 2017 trying to identify all the different policies tackling marine plastic litter in the European Union at national and subnational level. This report is already old, I have to say, because it's a snapshot of what happened at the time, but the things are going very fast in the policy domain when it comes to plastics nowadays. We have uh, had a number of discussions with the EU institutions, with the Parliament, with the Commission, with the Council, to try to always keep up the issue uh, in the political agenda, but also to try to see if we can come up with uh, solutions. Of course, not alone, but with everybody. I think collaboration has been a word that has been repeated several times, and I will also insist in that one. Uh, we have also now, we are part of the Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform uh, Coordination Group. I'm sure you are familiar with this European initiative, the Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. And in this context, biodiversity and circular economy, which are two environmental priorities, one is a tool and the other one is a, a number of targets that we want to achieve, how they relate with each other. And at the moment, this is not 100% clear. There are some uh, issues that are important to take into account, and there will be a report very soon coming up uh, that will be presented hopefully in February during the Secret Economy Stakeholder Platform meeting. And uh, we are collaborating with a number of organizations in this context, also the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, CITRA, the Innovation Fund from Finland, and the INEC, the French Institute for National, for National Institute for Circular Economy. And of course, we are participating in the context of the European Tire and Road Wear Particles Platform, the platform we are speaking about right now. Let's go to the next slide. 
this is we have already seen this as i said before there is a number of uh, organizations there that are helpful in this debate we are there in the civil society organizations that's okay because we have a number of members there but of course there are also others and as i said one of the important points of the work uh, for iucn as uh, as such because as we as i said we have a number of government and non-governmental organizations is to work together to try to find a consensus or try to facilitate discussions and try to be in the context of the where the solutions are being found therefore the participation in this platform for us is fundamental um, let's go to the next slide and i'm getting slowly to to the end this is just to try to make it also relevant in the context of the global discussion as i said before uh, this platform i think that we can all understand and believe that this is an example also of how the things could be working in other parts of the world Therefore, we presented also the platform uh, during the World Conservation Congress in Marseille only one month ago. It was uh, the first uh, physical, well, it was hybrid, but a huge meeting with a good number of participants. Actually, Facilet was also there, and I have to thank again very much uh, Facilet for being there during that uh, Congress. And uh, we, we presented this, uh, this as an example of how, the, how we can advance to get solutions beyond Europe. We also had an event, by the way, to launch this EU circular talk to relate biodiversity and circular economy, as I mentioned before. But there were also a number of resolutions that were approved during this uh, gathering. This is the gathering of the IUCN members. So I have 1,400 members, as I said, with close to 200 governments. So a number of governments also having a say here. And there are two resolutions that I'm going to mention here. One on stopping the global plastic pollution crisis, crisis in marine environment by 2030. And the second one to eliminate plastic pollutions in protected areas with priority action on single use plastic products. So there is a very inter important interest from the biodiversity side, let's say, to what is happening in the plastic pollution discussion. And this is, a, as I said, a global dimension. This is not only for Europe. And biodiversity here is especially important. Probably you are aware that next year there will be the COP15 of the, C of the CBD, the conference of the parties number 15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity. There will be an agreement next year on the global biodiversity framework, how the world plans to protect and conserve biodiversity during the next 10 years. At the very moment, actually, now, today, is starting the first high-level discussion in China of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, debate on the global biodiversity framework, but the approval will happen only in April. And there are some relevant targets in the draft that is uh, now being discussed that can be also the, uh, important for this discussion now. In particular, target seven, or I think is six in the newer draft, to reduce pollution from all sources to levels that are not harmful to biodiversity and ecosystem functions and human health. This, of course, includes plastic. So there will be a discussion about plastics also in this context very, very soon, or it's happening already. Not there will be, it's happening already. Also in the context of the monitoring framework for, the, for this biodiversity framework, we have two particular indicators or discussions about indicators that can be very helpful or are very important in the context of the plastic discussion. Reduction of pollution from plastics, which includes the trends in levels of pollution with marine plastic and the same for terrestrials and, and freshwater ecosystems. So there will be a discussion again about plastics in the context of the CBD. Let's go to the next uh, slide and I'm now getting to the end. Therefore, the relevance of the discussion today. I have to remember here that only five, six years ago, microplastics was just a starting, was not really a key issue. And the tires were actually not under the spotlight for plastic related issues. Well, look where we are, look where we are now with this event. We are starting to discuss this at, at, at this level and also with environmental discussion. So it's quite important. We can, all, we can only welcome that we are all now willing to tackle the challenge. And now is the time for the action. So some actions that could be important to think for the future. I already mentioned the CBD. That's an important one because it's happening right now and there will be some issues about plastic. So most probably microplastic will also be part of the debate. I have to mention also the continuation of the work on the, on the platform we are discussing now. I think it's important and we all agree that the collaboration here is fundamental. I would like also to emphasize the need to work with other sectors such as textiles. These are issues that are very different, yes, but there are actions and measures being discussed in the context of the policy. Uh, and we need to ensure that we find common ways forward here. The most important thing at the very end is to get the level of ambition from the EU as much as, as, as higher as possible to tackle microplastics. And in, in, the, in particular, in the context of the circular economy action plan. 
And uh, with this, I think that I would like to end. This is about us, this is about the future. And as I said, this is about the environment. When we discuss about conservation, it's not just about the conservation of nature, it's about the conservation of humans. All these actions are not so much about habitats and species, they are about us. This is the context of the SDGs. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went a little bit over time. It was challenging to do it in this time. Thank you. No, but in any case, thank you very much for um, your contribution, Alberto. And I, I would like to, because we are a little bit over time, so I need to close immediately. But as I said, questions in the chat can be answered in the chat directly, and it will stay open the platform for, for the coming months. But what I think we witnessed with this session is, and, and I didn't realize it before that it would be like that, uh, something that looks initially like a simple, relatively simple challenge. Eh? Ooh, how do we get rid of all these plastics or microplastics or tire and rotor particles that get into nature, in the soil, into the water, etc.? What looks like an initial simple challenge become for one sector eh, becomes suddenly a much wider topic involving different sectors and also different and complex trade-offs. So there is no simple one-way solution for that. And that's why I think EDRMA understood that uh, fairly soon and started this cross-sectorial program. But now I think it's time also when I hear, of course, there are knowledge gaps. Of course, there are things that each sector can do. But what I think, what I pick up from what I hear from the different speakers is we need just like, and it's an inspiration from the World Business Council, we need also even a stronger actionable roadmap now, an actionable roadmap that brings those sectors together in initiatives like the one uh, presented by the colleagues of the University of Berlin, and in others that we can roll out at a bigger scale. But for that, you need also the willingness, and I think also the support and the facilitation for example, of the Commission and of the different business sectors, to make sure that we can implement such a plan of action. Because there is a limit to the understanding, there is a limit also to regulation, there is no limit to joint action and joint initiatives on the ground. So with that, I would like to close this session. I'm sorry for my bad time management. 10 minutes late, I hope you found it interesting, and I hope that this continues also further in the chat of this session. I thank the World Business Council and ETRMA for co-hosting this session with us. I'm afraid I cannot give you the floor anymore, but I hope you found it interesting as well. And I thank all the panelists and speakers to this session. So thank you, have a nice day. Other topics are abundant in this summit over the coming days, so have a look at the website as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elisa, for all the support. Thank you, bye.